One of my greatest joys as a parent, as a teacher, as an engineering professor, as a person, is showing people how the world works and then letting them realize that they can actually change the world around them. And honestly, if at any point during my college or graduate studies when I was studying underwater propulsion and robots, someone had told me that one day I'd be standing up here talking to you about Plato, I would have laughed quite a bit. I would have thought it was very cool, but I still would have laughed and not quite seen how that could happen. But in my time working on robots and often sneaking off to art school at night and grad school, I really became enamored of electrical engineering and circuits. And even when it didn't directly apply to my work, I just thought it was so cool. And many of you may be pretty familiar with circuitry. It typically looks something like this. You've got components. You usually have a hard board. You've got a battery. You've got lots of wires. But there was really interesting work being done over the last few years by people like Leah Buckley at MIT who were taking these circuits and sewing them and painting them. And in the back of my mind, I always was thinking about this, that I loved sculpting. I loved Play-Doh. And wouldn't it be fun if at some point we could sculpt our circuits? And it really stayed in the back of my mind my first couple years as a faculty member. I was teaching machine design. I was teaching engineering graphics. But then I met this little person um, a few years ago. And like any parent, kind of the first thing I thought, or one of the first things I thought, was what cool things can I teach her? You know, how do I teach her to love the things that I love? And you know, Plato was part of it. We sculpted. We loved Plato. Um, but then in the spring of 2009, the student Sam Johnson, an undergrad, a first-year engineering student, walked into my office and asked if he could work with me. And I honestly didn't really have any jobs that summer. Um, but I asked him what he was interested in, and he mentioned the sculpting out of Plato project he had always thought of that had nothing to do with circuitry, but that was the eureka moment. And I said, you know, we'll find money. The university had some money for student researchers. Come for the summer, um, and you have a job with me. And I can only imagine what this sounded like to his parents when you call up after your first year of engineering school and say, I've got a research position with a professor. I'm working on Plato. But that's what he did. Right? And we had some criteria. We, this wasn't really a funded project. So anything we did had to be very cheap. And my goal was that other parents like me, and maybe ones who didn't have some of the engineering background that I had, could do this. So it had to be easy to make. And I also wanted it to be real. We didn't want to sculpt pictures of circuits. We wanted to sculpt circuits that worked. And as I learned more about parenting, I also learned that non-toxic, it's obvious that it should be non-toxic, but I didn't realize just quite how lickable Play-Doh is. So we did our research, and I'm used to going to journals, but a lot of our research wasn't quite journals. It was books like 101 Fun Things to Do with Your Preschooler on a Rainy Day. We also, though, interestingly, talked to engineers and talked to chemists, and we said, well, we want to sculpt circuits, non-toxic, really cheap, et cetera. And we had quite a few people say, good luck. I'm not so sure that's going to work. And it turns out that there were two groups of people that knew that it would work. One were high school physics teachers and kind of first year introductory physics teachers. Because it turns out, for years, they'd been, many of them had been using Plato to measure resistance, how amenable a material was to letting electricity through it. We, to this day, have never found anyone who was actively using that to create circuits, but they were measuring the conductivity of the Plato. And in the midst of this project, for fun, I went to a circuit bending workshop. Anyone know what circuit bending is? Great, fun thing, where people typically take apart toys, the really loud, annoying, screechy ones and talking ones, and reconfigure them and maybe change the circuitry and use it for music. And in the midst of this, this person who admitted that they didn't know much about circuits, in fact, they had all their own terminology for the engineering behind it, pulled out some Play-Doh to start shorting the circuits. I thought, oh, this is totally doable. So of course, since I said it was a highly funded project, we could go to all the best science research stores, um, like our local grocery store. And if you couldn't buy it at our local grocery store, it wasn't usable. Um, and we could use you know, very high-tech equipment and very high-tech science-grade um, supplies. So we spent the whole summer making these Play-Doh recipes. And any recipe out there was fair game. We were reading tons of these books for kids and parents on how to make Play-Doh. And this list probably looks familiar to many of you out there. Um, but it came down to, well, if we want enough electricity and current to run through this to light things up, which ratios do we need? And we made a bunch of them. At the end of the summer, we were able to do this. We could take some lumps of Play-Doh, we could plug in a six-volt battery pack, and we could actually make things light up. <laughs> or that's where the motor spins. But motors were spinning. And I was teaching. There we go. So basically, the, all those kids' toys that light up and make noise and spin and move, we just were making them out of Play-Doh. <laughs> so I was teaching a toy design class for middle schoolers that summer. So we brought it out to, to field test it with them. And you know, we got lots of cool sculptures. Of course, at the time, we could only build Play-Doh wire and resistors. So anyone who's done anything with circuits, um, for us, it's in the fifth grade standards in Minnesota, so lots of light bulbs were lit up. 
But if you let the wires touch in places they shouldn't, the lights go out or worse things happen. So we had to make space in between them, or we brought out you know, very high-tech saran wrap to separate the lumps of Play-Doh that were conducting electricity. And I said to Sam, I said, we need to come up with a way that it won't conduct electricity. We need a non-conductive. We need the insulator out of Play-Doh. Wouldn't it be cool if we had two? If we had one, our original Play-Doh recipe that conducts like a wire plus a resistor, and if we came up with another one, and we did, that insulates. So now we can insulate our Play-Doh wires with other Play-Doh. So one that conducts, one that doesn't conduct, or at least conducts so many thousands of times less that it works like an insulator. And we could actually end up with really complicated little circuits. And if you've looked at circuits before, it starts like something like this, right? This is what you'd see in an engineering textbook. You've got your power source. You've got the resistor that the current runs through. And then it runs through the light, giving off light as it passes through. But we said, this is what it typically looks like. You'd have to go and get these components. And I said, we're still going to use real components. But now instead of just grabbing our wires and resistors, we're going to teach kids how to make their own, right? So we could take those conductive doughs and stick those in and stick the insulating dough in, right? And now we have a circuit that a two-year-old or maybe a three-year-old could build. We were aiming middle school, but the age keeps dropping lower and lower, right? This was right before she taught her dad how to build a switch. And, you know, we could get a little fancier. One of the challenges in the lab is to come up with the best holiday one. Okay. But to figure this out, right, it actually was an engineering process. I could totally justify why this was research to my, my colleagues. Because we had to write scripts like this that would see how does the resistance and conductivity change over time. We had a whole corner of an electrical engineering research lab full of Play-Doh, hundreds of pounds of Play-Doh, right? We were running voltage, varying voltages, through different Play-Dohs to see how well we could get it to conduct so that kids could do more and more advanced circuitry with it. And my later research student, I had to bring on an electrical engineering student, and we had physicists trying to figure out, you know, how does this exactly work? And so we took more and more data and found that really we could make this work like a wire, like a wire plus a resistor. And so we stuck it all on the web, and we put every piece of information we had about it. We have how-to videos showing every step of Play-Doh, because if you haven't made it before, we'll show you how to, how to stir it and how to mix it and what ingredients and step-by-step -step instructions for how to do the different projects that we kept updating. And you know, we figured, oh, we kind of need a Facebook page. So we did that. And it was amazing. People just found this project. We have a couple hundred people that share their notes on it. And this is really rewarding as a professor because we could see workshops started popping up everywhere. Again, I don't endorse licking the Play-Doh, but apparently you know, some people have, right? particularly if the whole class has used it for a while. It's not edible. We'll keep the non-toxic part to ourselves. And, but, you know. and they kept popping up everywhere. Right? We started seeing people around the world using this. And that's really fun and rewarding. But the really interesting part is, in the design process, you want feedback. And we got lots of good feedback, but then we learned things like it's really hard to find cream of tartar in rural Japan. It's also really hard to find it in um, rural France. I had a group of mothers in rural fan France, I found en Francais in Twitter, talking about where they could get it from the local pharmacist. So we needed a better way to do this so it could be cheap anywhere. And we did some research, and it turns out that we can substitute lemon juice for the cream of tartar. Right? Another really interesting lesson was the original Insulating dough used alum. Has anyone cooked with alum? OK, so alum is often used in things like pickles. And I live in Minnesota, land of the state fair. We know how to make pickles. So you can find it in all our grocery stores, but not so much in the rest of the world. So this recipe kept evolving. Right? So if you go every couple months, the recipe changes. For example, I knew some people couldn't eat gluten, but until I started talking with a lot of teachers, didn't realize that you need different Play-Doh. If you're allergic to gluten, it can't be in the Play-Doh. So we had gluten-free recipes for it as well. <laughs> right. So it was the story of this sort of simple-sounding thing that became this grand project for groups of chemists, physicists, education majors, um, and engineering students. This is my current student, Matt. And we thought, we've given the world the Play-Doh recipes, and they can do whatever they want with them. That's probably enough. But it turns out that many people don't have resistors and battery packs and such at home. And we had linked to Radio Shack and other places, but it turned out that to get all the pieces you needed to build kind of the cool flashing, spinning, beeping ones, you needed to go to a couple stores. Um, so one of my students, um, I think he was only a second year student at the time, started his own company, packaging these kits that he now sends around the world that are just the little components. But that just because you put it out there wasn't enough. You had to facilitate the rest of it, which was a big lesson for us. We never intended for anyone involved with the project to have to sell kits. Um, but that was really how they could bring it to people who might not have worked with electricity before. Um, and so we started getting pictures like this from a mother who said I could share this picture of um, you know, two quite small kids who are now you know, circuit designers. And as I mentioned, we started with middle school, because I was teaching middle school that summer. 
But then it was elementary school, and this is actually a three-year-old classroom that built some of the neatest little light-up structures I've ever seen. Uh, my very anecdotal research is that four-year-olds absolutely love LEDs, but it's all about the motors for the three-year-old preschool class. The spinner, my daughter calls them the spinners. And then we said, well, what do we do next? Um, we have teachers using this all around. What, what else could we do? Are we done? Do we move on to the next project? Um, but we started having upper-level teachers say, well, what could we do if we added microprocessors? Right? And that became an interesting thing for us. And here's one of my favorites. As you use more dough, it's longer and more resistant. Can we have the sound, please, on this? Because the longer it the longer the piece of dough is, the higher the resistance. And if you measure the resistance, you could do that. So similarly, if you're teaching about kind of light mixing RGB LEDs and such, we thought, well, could we build our own little light mixer where to change colors? You just play with the Play-Doh. And so we have three Play-Doh. The color doesn't matter. We just color it so it's easier to control. Um, and as we stretch them, it's going to change the lights. So you can see the hands in the back that are stretching. And by lengthening the red and changing the ratio of red to green or blue, we can change the colors that come out. So it proved to me that there's really a wonderful science or engineering lesson behind almost anything in the world you look at. And by pulling together a team that included educators and chemists and, and engineers, you know, we could turn this really playful thing, again, Play-Doh, giving a research talk on Play-Doh, into something that made it accessible for kids and parents of all ages. Um, so, so never forget the importance of play in what you do. Thank you. Thank you.